Guys, I want to tell you about one of the new sponsors of the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Since 1992, Herky Jerky has been committed to providing the highest quality beef, buffalo, elk, venison, turkey, and bacon snacks to their customers. Their award-winning jerky and meat sticks are high in protein, low in fat and carbs, and are the perfect choice for hunters, anglers, boaters, campers, outdoorsmen, or anyone searching for a quick, healthy snack. All Herky Jerky products are proudly made in the USA with top quality ingredients. When Herky Jerky meat sticks and jerky arrives at your front door, you can be confident that they will be the freshest you've ever tasted. Your satisfaction is guaranteed. Jerky has been the fastest growing snack in the country for the last four years, and while there are many brands to choose from, Herky Jerky is one of the only companies out there that can combine two things. Great taste and size. The great taste will speak for itself when you try it, but the large quantity, bulk size packs is something unique to Herky Jerky. Most of my listeners have probably tried a few different kinds of store-bought jerky, and if you're like me, you're always disappointed that most of the bags you pick up at the grocery store or gas station are in, in these little wimpy mamby pamby three or four ounce bags a couple of handfuls and you're basically finished with the bag what i love about herky jerky is that everything they sell is in bulk each pack is anywhere from 12 and a half ounces to one and a half pounds so when you go out on hunts you have enough to last your whole trip when you go to the herky jerky website you'll see that the prices are probably a little more than you're used to from jerky but the value is there considering how much you're getting in each pack you get as much in a couple of their big packs as you would in 10 packs of store-bought jerky herky jerky's product lineup can be broken down into two groups jerky and meat sticks there are 10 different kinds of jerky and seven varieties of meat sticks all of them are delicious the game jerky and sticks consist of venison hot venison buffalo and elk first of all I haven't seen a lot of companies that offer game jerky in bulk, especially in the sticks, and I certainly haven't tasted anything as good as theirs. The jerky has a nice consistency to it without being too hard on the teeth and it's not overly gamey. The sticks are really unique. Don't think of Slim Jims because that doesn't do them justice. They have the right amount of snap to them and they aren't filled with byproducts and they have just the perfect taste. HerkyJerky.com is doing a special for the month of July, and it's a generous $10 off any order of $50 or more, and it includes free shipping. All you got to do is use the J. Scott promo code at checkout. Go to HerkyJerky.com now and check them out. That's H-E-R-K-Y Jerky.com. Guys, I'm excited about one of the new sponsors of the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Canyon Coolers is based right here in Arizona and makes premium roto-molded ice chests that work. The Outfitter Series coolers are made with near vertical exterior walls to fit snugly into tightly packed hunting rigs without a lot of wasted space. They come at a fraction of the cost of some of the big name brands. Canyon Coolers is a small operation. If you have a question, if you have a problem, you can pick up the phone and talk to a human being, not an answering service. Canyon Coolers offers the industry's only vortex-like warranty, which is completely Completely no fault, no hassle warranty for as long as you own the cooler. How can you beat that? It's literally the last ice chest you'll ever need to buy. Just for the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners, you save 10%. All you got to do is go to canyoncoolers.com and enter the J. Scott promo code at checkout and you're going to get a 10% discount. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today is going to be a fun episode with my friend Brendan, Brendan Burns, who is the uh, director director of industry relations at Kuyu. Whatever that means, Brendan, how you doing? Doing well. Yeah, it means uh, relations of all trades. To people. Yeah, do whatever you need to do. So, yeah, it's all good. Awesome. It was uh, great seeing you um, at the. Uh, Kuyu Mountain Academy a week or so ago um, in Sacramento, and I think um, I've gotten quite a bit of feedback from people that went to the seminars, and it sounds like people got a lot of value from them. Um, I also uh, noticed that Kuyu put those seminars up on their YouTube channel, so if anybody out there is listening, um, you can actually watch the seminars, the slides, and everything from the PowerPoints um, of those um, you know, presentations. And Brendan, you did a phenomenal presentation. Paul Bride did one on um, photography, which was, I thought, outstanding. 
uh, Lance uh, Kronberger of Freelance uh, Outdoor Adventures did did one on uh, wet, cold, and miserable in Alaska, and 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 I know everyone always gets a lot out of uh, Lance. Um, Jason did a couple, um, and um, it was it was just a good time out there. Um, it's probably not out or released yet, but uh, you just got back from a unbelievable bear hunt uh, with Lance. Um, how was that? It was pretty uh, pretty incredible. Yeah, we we hunted the Alaska Peninsula this spring, and uh, yeah, we got a we got a film coming out here pretty quick. Quick, that's uh, it's pretty incredible. We had a we had an amazing you know on brown bears. Um, Especially like me hunting with a bow is one of those things that's uh, man I've been dreaming about that since I was a little kid. So we just keep an eye out for it. It's pretty cool. So it was uh, it was a pretty incredible trip. Um, just something different, and uh, you know always cool to go out and you know the elements and it, it was just it was an incredible trip. So uh, Jason killed a great big bear. I killed a great big bear. Um, we saw some. The footage of yours is unreal. Um, you showed me a little bit. And it was just unbelievable. I can't wait for people to check it out. It was, I mean, I was just, my jaw was on the ground watching how it all unfolded. Um, the reason I want to talk to you today, obviously I'm about eight days out from going to Arctic Red River on my first doll sheep hunt. Um, and then, of course, I've got the Chugach hunt. You've been on the Chugach uh, hunt, a different, different unit, but... Uh, You've kind of been helping me along, getting my gear prepared and what have you. Um, how many doll sheep hunts have you been on roughly, and how many doll rams have you killed yourself? I have killed four. Um, I've hunted in Alaska twice, uh, once in Alaska range. Uh, actually, I've hunted Alaska three times. I've hunted twice in the Chugach, once in Alaska Range. Uh, I killed a ram in the Yukon in Bonaplume, which is basically next to where you're hunting at Arctic Red, but it's in the Yukon. And I took a doll sheep in the Northwest Territory. So I've, everywhere except for British Columbia, there's a small area that has them in BC, but I've hunted all of them and, and been on, I don't know, as far as kill, probably about 15 kill, 12 or 15 kill. I'd have to add it up. You got me on, got me on the spot there, but... Um, you know, stone sheep, doll sheep, uh, northern hunts like that, you know, a bunch. So I've got my, yeah. um, been on a few, few, quite a few that I wasn't the hunter, quite a few that I was. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, Brendan, um, you know, I've talked a little bit about this um, with you, uh, obviously off the podcast, but i um, trying to wrap my arms around, you know, if you're in my shoes, you've never, you know, never had your own personal sheep hunt. I've certainly guided uh, handfuls of bighorn hunts and what have you. Um, and I've got these two hunts. I've got the Northwest Territories with Arctic Red, and then I've got the Chugach with Lance. Two totally different hunts from what everybody's telling me. Obviously the same animal, but then you've got, you know, you know, twisty, flared-out kind of rams, smaller bases in the Northwest Territories, and you got, you know, bigger based rams, maybe some broomed-off rams, maybe a potential chance for a bigger ram um, on the Chugach. Um, you know, as far as I typically hunt, and I, you know, I typically try and hunt for something, you know, what I would consider a, a great trophy, um, walk me through a little bit, and I know some listeners will get some value out of, uh, you know, because I've had tons of messages from guys that are going on their first trips here in a couple weeks and, and on into the summer. Walk me through mentally having two hunts. Um, does that change your mindset in any way that I should be, you know, um, just trying to go shoot two mature rams? Or, like, would you say, hey, Jay, you know, follow this model and you'll be all right? Talk to me a little bit about, you know, maybe what I should expect, um, you know, you know, and, and, and what I should shoot, honestly. I mean, I, I don't really want to be done on the first day, but, I mean, if a great ram presents itself, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm never one to, to, you know, if it's a giant, not shoot it. I mean, I, I've been on hunts where I've guided, and guys say, I don't want to shoot it the first day, and I'm looking at a, you know, 114, 15-inch coos there, and it's like, listen, well, you know, we could definitely go this whole hunt and next year's hunt, and the year after, never see a buck like this. So I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are and what my mindset should be. 
Well, I mean, you got you, you're about a, what a month apart between the hunts in between. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I did back to back um, in 2015. I actually did three three in 90 days. Um, but one of them is uh, you've never taken a doll sheep, so I would look at you know when you go to the NWT, you're going to want to take you know a nice big mature ram. I, I don't think anybody should shoot a young ram no matter what. So I mean, that's again my opinion. That doesn't mean it's not legal or anything else. But um, I'd go to the NWT and I'd, I'd shoot a real nice ram. Um, you're there for a, you, I mean that's that's a full backpack hunt and where yeah. you're there and, yeah. and and you're you're there to stay. So um, right. they don't you don't really leave early from the NWT. You're going to be there the whole time. So I'd go, um, you know, I'd, I'd go look for your guide's going to let you know along the way. I mean, they're not going to let you walk away from a great big ram on the first day because you want to get more of the experience. Um, right. It, it it depends. I mean, I always say like. If you can go home without one, you can be picky. If if you want to get one, um, maybe don't be quite as picky. I would look for an old ram, a good-looking ram. You know, they shoot some really nice-looking rams in uh, at Arctic Red. They killed some beautiful sheep there last year. They probably had their best year ever. Um, and then, <clears throat> you know, and you're going to see the full the full experience on that hunt. I mean, you're going to do some walking. I mean, the odds of you getting dropped off and walking 400 yards and seeing a 40-inch ram um, are pretty slim. If that does happen, I would suggest pounding them. Um, but and then you guys can, can uh, you know spend a couple of days uh, taking care of the hide and doing a little walking around, and looking around. But um, I'd never let some great big go. And you know, if you see a ram that you don't really like the look of, don't shoot it. Um, and then conversely, on the chew catch, um, if Lance tells you to shoot it, it's on the first day you kill it because it, I mean you you can get weather that. You may never, you might not see another ram, or those areas are a little more compact. You're going to do some scouting early. Um, he's going to kind of know where you want to go, what you're looking for, and when you get an opportunity, th- those opportunities in the Chugach are few and far between. There's not a ton of sheep like where you're going in the NWT, so you need to take advantage when you get an opportunity. Um, you can go walk around in the ice and the brush and get that experience um, after you kill one. So I would I'd definitely. Yeah. When he tells you, you know, and again, that's that's why you go with good guides. They're gonna they're gonna tell you like I would not let this one go. And if you got an eight year old thirty five inch ram that you know is like kind of a squeaker in the NWT that they say nah let's wait then wait he, you know that's his experience yeah. that's that's why you rely on your guide. So yeah, and I think that's good advice. You know I'm I've never been a guy that has to go on a hunt and has to come home with something. I, I, you know, I, I want to get a couple nice rams, um, and I'm perfectly fine if I don't, if I go on two trips and don't get any ram. I don't, you know, I've told this to people and they roll their eyes, but I mean, I don't have to check doll sheep off my list. I'm going for an incredible hunt. Um, and if I see a ram that I like and the guide says, you know, that's a great ram, um, then I'm going to be tickled pink. So I, I'm pumped about that. Um, you know, not, not having ever traveled up there, Brendan, I'm going to go from, I'm actually going to go out of Denver to Edmonton to Norman, or to Yellowknife and then to Norman Wells. Um, and, you know, it looks, when you just start making reservations, you're like, yeah, I'm going to go from here to here to here. And then you start realizing how far up there it is. I mean, it's, it's literally it's two like days. two days two-day yeah, travel. Yeah, it's a two-day trip, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's um, one of the nice things about, about the Chugach is, you know, like I've, I've hunted the Chugach three times now. I leave Bozeman at 6.15 a.m., and I'm in the unit at noon. I fly into Anchorage yeah. at 10.30 or whatever, 11 o'clock, and, you know, twice I've been out in the unit hunting that evening. Not hunting, obviously, because you can't fly and hunt, but um, in the walking area, walking in towards the area, whereas, you know, when you go to the NWT or the, or the northern Yukon, it's a full on two days. I actually, since I'm close to Mont, since I'm close to the Canadian border, I actually drive to Calgary and then fly up. For me, it's a lot faster than because everything either funnels through Edmonton or funnels through Vancouver, and it takes me just as long. And then if I get bumped, it's more expensive. So I just drive to Calgary and fly up from there. But yeah, it's a long, it's a long travel. Um, you know, you're you're basically a, it's a ten day hunt is a fourteen day hunt up there. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask you. On those travel days, so the first day I go to Edmonton, I mean, are you doing anything? Because, you know, if, if, if you're hiking and, you know, exercising basically every day for the last, you know, 60 days, and then you go two days of travel and you don't do anything, is that how you prepare? Or do you actually, you know, go on a couple-mile walk? Or how do you, how do you kind of stay, stay loose? 
Um, yeah, I just try not to eat too much, to be honest. It's one of those things with traveling. You don't want to get, you know, go grab a couple beers at the, uh, <laughs> at the airport, you know, uh, place there and, and eat a bunch of pizza. Like, I just try and keep everything normal and, you know, traveling's always a pain, especially if you got long layovers or, you know, I was, I, I like to get a hotel if, uh, if I'm going out there and just, you know, just kind of take it easy and, you know, all the work you've done is, it, it's done. It, it's not going to make a difference, like going for a jog the day before or anything like whatever you've done, it's already done and just get prepared and, you know, hopefully not nurse any injuries or anything, but, um, no, I don't really do anything. Again, that's one of the reasons I drive to Calgary is that it's, you know, I drive to Calgary and I'm one hop, you know, so I'll usually leave in the afternoon and get to Calgary that evening, stay the night, jump on an Air North flight, and I'm pretty much at my destination that evening, which is which is nice for me. But for you, if you're going the two days, um, yeah, you just want to, I, like I said, everybody's different. I just try not to overeat. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And probably not eat anything goofy that, you know, you're not kind of normally used to eating, so, you you know, your system gets all out of whack. Might not um, want to go out for sushi. Just, just, just in case. <laughs> uh, they're telling me that, you know, to be prepared when you um, hit the deck at Norman Wells, even though I have a hotel room there booked, that if the weather's good, that there might be a guy waiting at the airport and they'll try and fly me to base camp right away. Um, you know, and, and I've talked to guys that have gone both ways where, yes, they did stay the night and then they, they went ahead and went out the next day and then, you know, they they were basically ready and, and flown out to base camp. Um, and then, and then with that, sometimes depending on whether you're either going to stay the night in base camp or they're going to get you right out into the field. Um, have you had those situations where, I mean, boom, you land and you're immediately out into the field and do you prefer that or would you rather prefer staying overnight and kind of just getting everything, you know, last minute dialed in and, and, you know, what's your preference? Yeah, I kind of look at it like if I need an extra prep day or something like that, I'm going to catch it on the front side. But um, I want to be in sheep country as fast as possible. I've seen weather go bad, horribly bad, to where the faster you can get into where you're hunting and you're not relying on uh, on an airplane, the better off you are. So whatever they say to do, that's what I would do because um, I've done a bunch of them, whether it's we've been dropped off with a helicopter, I've been dropped off with an airplane multiple times, dropped off with a boat a couple times. Um, obviously, in the chew gas is walk-in only. I mean, we get rolling as fast as possible. You want to be in sheep country and sheep hunting as soon as you can. Um, you know, you can you can hang out at base camp on the way out and, you know, check out what they got for cu- cuisine there. But um, I, I want to get in sheep country as fast as possible. And it only takes a few times on missing flights and getting stuck for two or three days here or there, getting stuck in bad weather. Um, man, if they, if they got time to get you in, do everything you can to get in as fast as you can. Okay, that's good advice. Um, you're also headed doll sheep hunting uh, this summer as well. Um, what what rough time frame are you guys? I believe you're going in August, aren't you? Yeah, we're going uh, back to Bonnet Plume, um, which is basically borders where you you know is borders in the Yukon where you're hunting. Um, we're going the seventh. I'm doing uh, a. I think it's this. I think we're hunting the ninth through the nineteenth, or the ninth through the twentieth, and then I'm um, I'm going with Greg McHale after that for a mountain goat hunt down in British Columbia, kind of doing a back to back deal. But um, we're headed up there. Yeah, the, the basically the second week of August through the twentieth is about what it works out to be. I'm, I don't have a plane ticket here, but I think it's the. I think we're actually physically hunting the ninth through the nineteenth, or something like that. So. Okay. Next question is. Um, I've obviously looked at a lot of bighorns, um, desert and rocky, more desert than rockies, but um, never even seen a thin horn sheep. Um, you know, when you look at the horns, when you're looking at the body size, I mean, I know every big, big horn that I've seen looks big. I mean, they just look big. Um, obviously, some are bigger than others. Uh, and there's, you know, ways that I can, you know, say, well, geez, I missed that ram or that ram's bigger than I thought he was or, you know, this, that, or the other. When you're looking at doll sheep, um, you know, the horns compared to the body size and what have you, like what's going to jump out at me? 
or you know what do you look for i mean normally like i'm on big horns i'm looking for that four-year ring where there's a distinct you know you know almost two line gap where you know the most distinct is that the same thing with thin horns um and i know um the guide will be there but you know going into it i kind of want to be prepared mentally for what to expect and what to look for in a big ram yeah, I mean, it, it's the same way as far as age them. You know, they, you, you're you going to age them. Like, the first ring you can really count is basically three and a half. Um, they call it four in Alaska. They call it three some places. But, you know, you're talking three and a half. Born in the spring, died in the fall, if you kill them in the fall. So you're, you're hunting them in the fall, obviously, or midwinter. So you're they're, they're three and a half at the first ring you can count. And um, I find with doll sheep, as far as looking at them, uh, what can be deceiving is dark horns versus light horns. The really, really dark rams are hard to age, and light rams tend to have the rings really show up easily. I mean, obviously, I'm always looking for an old ram now. I mean, I, my first ram was eight years old that I killed, you know, ten years ago in Alaska, and everything else has been ten plus um, since then. So I'm always looking for old rams. You want to look for, you know, and again, it's preference. Like this hunt I'm going on, I'm taking my bow. I'm not taking a rifle. I will absolutely ha- put the hammer down on a on a big ugly double groomer. You know, something that's old is all that matters to me um, on this particular hunt. But most of the time, when you see a really big thin horn, I've only probably seen maybe eight or ten really big thin horn rams, whether I was hunting or with somebody else or whatever. It's a no brainer. I mean, they're you know generally way above the nose. You know, they stand out off their head. I mean, like you, you don't miss. You, you, you don't miss the, if you if you got to really judge one to see if it's legal or not unless it's bro, unless it's broomed or you know for some reason you, you know not what you know smaller I would guess but the the big ones you don't miss I mean that you know I mean obviously you saw like like Brian's ram that he killed up there at Arctic Red last year I mean not like you had to stare at that ram very long no no exactly yeah. and, and again that ram I don't know what that what was that ram like forty one or forty or something like that I mean that's that's a, yeah I think it's no. just at forty. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the ones that are going to kind of be hard to tell are 35 and 9, you know, 9 years old, 35, not super heavy. You kind of go, ah, he's pretty nice, but, like, you know, so that's one you got to, you know, that's where you rely on your guide. You know, they've looked at a lot more thin horns than, than I have, than you have, and uh, they're going to tell you, yeah, that's a super old ram. Maybe he's not the biggest ram in the world, or, no, that's a young ram. We're walking away from him, you know. Yeah. As far as, you know, hunting them in July, um, I, I imagine that I'm going to have, you know, rams that are together. Um, how common is it to have, you know, a, a good, you know, good age, you know, shooter, shooter class type ram alone? And then how common is it for them to, you know, always have two or three buddies with them in the Northwest Territories? I guess what I'm saying is if, like, I'm glassing and I see four rams, should I st- kind of be like, huh, okay, you know, or am I looking for that lone ram that's all by himself that, you know, typically the old, you know, bruiser rams are always by themselves type of scenario? Yeah, there's no real rule of thumb on that. I've seen super old rams with, you know, in bands of 15, and, and you know, like Jason killed that 14-year-old, um, you know, I killed a 15-year-old in Shugach that was by himself. Jason killed that 14-year-old that was just living up, basically getting ready to die up when we were at Nahanni. Um, I've seen some rams in the Shugach that were, you know, big solo rams. A lot of it depends on the density of the area and stuff. I mean, there's, I, I, you basically, you know, in the Yukon a couple years ago, um, I killed a 13-year-old that was, uh, he was living with one other ram. you got to look at everyone close enough to where you know what it is. I would definitely wouldn't glass one over and be like, ah, oh, there's six together. They're probably little. Eh, you probably better get a better look at them. I, mean, I, I try and get, that's why I carry big glass on these hunts is because I want to get a look to identify each sheep, even if it's a long, long ways away. Um, you just never know. I mean, you could, you could have a giant living by himself, or you could have a band that has a great big old one in with it. You just never know. You know how... Um, big horns, the body size can vary from, you know, state to state, from unit to unit. I mean, even from ram to ram, you got two rams laying there, and all of a sudden they stand up, and one's way bigger bodied, you know, a lot more mature. And then sometimes, man, their horns look big, and all of a sudden it's a small body. Is it the same thing with doll sheep as far as, you know, you got to really watch the body size or not so much um, with, with the dolls? You're going to run into that more in the Chugach as far as great big bodies. There, I mean, it, 
in 2015, I killed a ram in, in the NWT that was 12 and a half years old, and then I killed the one in, in the Chugach, and it was a week later. It was one of the things that struck me was like, holy cow, this Chugach ram was 60 pounds bigger. I mean, way bigger. I mean, it is significantly bigger. Um, and um, in the NWT, they do kill some big rams every now and again that are like eight or nine that have huge bodies that are kind of slipped by like, a guy will shoot one and like, yeah, we thought he was pretty nice and turns out it was giant, you know, really big bases or something. But in general, I think they're, you know, the two guys are going to have bigger body rams than, than in the NWT. But, you know, again, that's, that's, you know, there's no really rule of thumb. You could have a great big ram in the NWT or you could have, uh, or you could have a small ram in the two guys. They've killed, you know, there's dwarf rams around. I've, I've killed a big horn that was a dwarf ram on time. So, um, you know, again, that's, you know, just just one of those reasons, like, before you pull the trigger, just make sure you like the look of him, because he may be slightly smaller, he may be slightly bigger than you think he is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but if you're saying, if, you know, if you're going off of age, whether they are a, you know, small-bodied ram, but, you know, it's an old ram, in, in your book, as long as it's a mature old ram, you, you don't really care if he's big-bodied, small-bodied, or what have you. I mean, you can count rings and be like, yeah, that's a that's 11, that's a 12-year-old, like, I'm shooting it. I don't care if he's got a giant body or a small body, right? Yeah, and you're not going to have, I mean, again, unless you shot a true dwarf, but they, they do exist. I mean, there's guys that have shot rams that, that are like an app, like 80-pound dog-type, dwarf-type sheep, which is just a bummer when it happens. It's kind of like, oh, you got you. Um, but most of the time, I mean, they're, they're within a range. I mean, especially, um, you know, the ones that's really going to fool you are, are lone rams, you know, just like with the big yeah. horns. You, know, you get one that's by himself, and you go, man, I hope he's got a good-sized body. Or That's why you just don't want to, you know, bank on it having a big body or a small body. And, again, that's, you know, all this stuff I would default to your guide. I mean, Tavis, Tavis and Lance, they, they don't have guys that don't know what they're doing. I mean, and most of the time they're going to really lay down the pack and say, shoot that one. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, you, you, again, you're, you know, where the body size and judge and sheep really comes more into play is some of the open units in Alaska where, you know, it's just not a high density of, of sheep and you're looking for an 8-year-old, you know, and you're really deciding is that ram 7 or 8 and, you know, is it a legal ram, how far above full curl? Like most of the time in the Northwest Territories and, and basically all the time in the chew gas because chew gas rams rarely get full curl. I mean, they, they do. That's That's kind of a generalization. But if you can't, like you could go your whole guiding career in the NWT and not have to count rings. You just if you just hunted full curl rams. I mean, most of them get the full curl. If you hunted, if you were guiding in the Chugach and you didn't know how to count rings, you might not kill a sheep. There's a lot of rams that will never get the full curl that are gigantic because of the drop and how, you know, how how hoopy they are. And, and it's not a super common um, characteristic in the Chugach. Of, you know, big over the nose, flipped out. You know kind of full curl rams. I mean, there's a lot of big, hoopy, low-slung, great big rams that just will never be full curl. So um, you're not going to run into that in the NWT so much as you will in the Chugach. And again, that's, these are why you go with the right guys. You know. From a strategy standpoint, if you found a ram that you wanted to kill, I, I know obviously it depends on where you find him, where he's at, and what have you. But as a rule of thumb, um, if you find one that you want to kill, do you want to loop up and get all the way up and around and above them and be shooting down on them? Um, or do you try and slip, you know, straight across from them on the ridge? I assume you never want to just get below them and shoot up. You always want to be level or above them. Is that correct? Or walk me through kind of your thoughts on general rules of thumb. Yeah, I mean, general rule of thumb is if you can get above them, you, you should. Um, but on the other hand, especially if you're rifle hunting, um, you want to get, you know, as close as you can get. If that means, gosh, I've actually shot the one, two, three. I've shot the three of them from below. <laughs> and and it just, you know, if the wind is coming straight down on you, you'd be crazy to get above them. And especially if you can get close, you know, if you can get 100 or 200 or, um, you know, you want to, you, you just want to hunt them like anything else. I mean, as a rule of thumb, if you can get above them, they're not going to look up as much as they are looking down. I mean, they're definitely watching for predators down. Um, but if the conditions above you, I mean, if the wind's blowing straight down the mountain, and I, I wouldn't go out of your way to get above them. You know, you can come in from the side or use the terrain. But all things being equal, um, like any sheep, it's it's better to come in from above. Okay, good stuff. Uh, look, 
let's take a quick break here to uh, hear about our sponsors, and then I want to get into talking about your gear list, um, going through all your gear list and all your food that you're going to be taking, and we can bounce off some of the stuff that um, might be different that I'm taking. Okay, guys, I want to tell you about one of the new sponsors at the J. Scott Outdoors podcast, and I'm excited to tell you about this awesome team of dynamic realtors that I know very well. Dar Colburn, who has been my hunting and guiding partner for over 20 years, has partnered up with my nephew, Jay Pyburn, to create the Colburn Pyburn team. If you're looking to buy or sell any real estate in the state of Arizona, you can't go wrong with the Colburn Pyburn team. Dara and I have been in the real estate business for over 20 years together. And my nephew Jay is an up and coming realtor that has many sales under his belt and, and is a phenomenal resource for any person looking to buy or sell real estate in the state of Arizona. Just for the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners, if you have any real estate needs at all, if you use the Colburn Pyburn team, you're going to get a $500 gift certificate from any retail shop of your liking. Kuyu, Outdoorsman's, Sportsman's Warehouse, Cabela's, Amazon, you name it. $500. If you use the Colburn Pyburn team and they sell one of your properties that you either buy or sell, you get a $500 gift certificate. All you got to do is send an email to colburnpyburnteam at gmail.com and get your real estate needs taken care of. That's C-O-L-B-U-R-N-P-Y-B-U-R-N team, colburnpyburnteam at gmail.com. Okay, Brendan, let's talk about um, gear that you're taking on your hunt and and then obviously we'll talk about what's in your pack, your optic, uh, and then we'll talk about your food. Um, let's start with the top. Uh, and we'll do top, bottom, and then do in your pack. Um, y- you sent me a list, so I've got the list here. Uh, you've got Chugach rain jacket. Can yeah, be- before we dive into that, jacket? Jay, real yeah. quick, I, was like, I found that that's the easiest way to... You know, because if you send a guy a great big list, he's got everything on there. And they, they, you know, like, well, how does this fit in? That's why I do it. I do, I do top, bottom in my pack, optics, personals. I break it down on stuff so that you can figure. You know, it's like, why do I have two jackets? It doesn't make any sense. Well, it's like one you're carrying, you know, in case of emergency or whatever. So, um, anyways, um, one thing I would say is before we dive into the gear list, like, it's super important. I, I mean, after the the seminar last week, um, I've had a just a pile. I, I cannot believe the response. But one of the things I tell guys, like, it's really important to build a physical gear list, like to actually put it down on paper where it's got check marks and, and yes, I've got that or no, I don't. Like, a lot of guys are kind of like wing it and go in their head. Build an actual gear list. You know, I, I, I can say, and, and if weight is important to you, buy a scale. You know, there's, there's these archery scales that are, you know, 100 pounds. Um, you can hook your stuff on it or a, a food scale or anything else. Like, actually... If you're going to do it right, you need to have a scale to weigh out your stuff. You need to have the right stuff to travel with, I, like a big bag, um, like our taku bags, or you know how you pack your stuff going out there in your um, in your firearm case or anything else. Like it's real important to like lay out an actual gear list so you don't forget anything. I mean, the gear list is more um, not just to make sure you have everything, but what you're not forgetting. It's also to keep it so you don't put any extra stuff in it. Um, you know, so just I, I just tell guys like actually build a gear list. Good stuff. I mean, I'm use, I've am i been using your gear list as kind of my go-to that I'm, you know, I started with yours, and anywhere where I have a change, I just add in. Yep. Um, you know, I think that, that really helped me. Um, let me go through your top uh, portion, and then we'll talk about it. Chugach rain jacket, Kenai hooded jacket, 97 or 240 Peloton hoodie, uh, two 125 Merino short sleeve, the attack glove, the Peloton 200 glove, Peloton 240 beanie, Kuyu cap, Merino neck gaiter, Super Down Pro jacket, Super Down pant. Uh, I'm going to start at the top. Uh, Chugach rain jacket. I've had several guys send me questions wanting to know why I'm not using the Yukon. And my answer why I'm using the Chugach is simply from a weight standpoint. It's kind of, you know, um, Kuyu has three 
uh, rain gear systems with the Chugach being the middle one, which is not as heavy duty as the Yukon, but you're going to get a, it's a lot lighter than the Yukon. Um, is that the same reason why you're not taking the Yukon? Yeah, we, we basically built three rain gears. We build like lower 48 incidental super lightweight rain gear, which is the Ultra. We build the Chugach, which is the backpack rain gear, which is as durable and as light, you know, it's pared down, it doesn't have pockets on the pants, but it's 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 the perfect backpack rain gear, and obviously built for weight and an extended hunt. And then the Yukon is super durable. If you're living in your rain gear, horses, you know, like um, if you're guiding and going to spend 100 days straight in it or you're looking for extreme durability, and they're basically the Chugach is twice the weight of the Ultra, and the Yukon is twice the weight of the Chugach. So I, I'm, I'm taking it, like, I always take the Chugach on, um, on backpack hunts. Okay. And then the, I noticed you have the Kenai hooded jacket, which I love that jacket. And obviously it's more for an active hunt, a moving hunt where, you know, you're hiking in your jacket and what have you. I would assume, uh, you know, you're also taking the Super Down uh, Pro jacket. Um, but my question would be on my hunt in July, you know, if it's anything like last year, which it could be totally different, everybody was saying how warm of a hunt it was. And if if you're looking at warm conditions, would the Kenai jacket be one that you would potentially leave out? Um, or is the Kenai jacket always going to be on, you know, on a Northwest Territories hunt, always have it with you? No, and again, this is a lot of this stuff is just personal preference, too. I mean, like a lot of guys like a soft shell because um, it's got a little more windbreak to it. Um, I, I like the Kenai. Uh, it compacts down pretty good. I basically take two insulated jackets instead of I don't take a soft shell anymore. I just I, I found the Kenai to be a little bit more versatile. It's it's a little bit insul it's insulated, but you can hike in it. Um, obviously, you can't hike in your super down any kind of down jacket. It's you just get sweated up too fast. Um, so it's just personal preference. I like the fact that. Um, it, it squishes down pretty small. I can keep it in my pack. Um, I can roll up some stuff in it to make sure nothing's getting beat up. Um, I just It's just a personal preference. I mean, like I said, you could substitute, uh, you know, a, 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 a Chinook jacket. You could substitute a guide jacket. You could substitute, um, if you want to, if you're going super, super light, you could just take the Super Down Pro and your Chugach, which would be just fine. Um, it just depends. There's, there's a few things that I do in my system that's just worth it for me. Um, to carry a little something extra. Um, so just obviously personal okay. preference. And then a 97 or a 240 Peloton hoodie, which I have both of those. I love both of those. Um, the 97 obviously is a lot lighter than the 240. Um, would you say on most hunts, would you consider taking the 97? Or on most hunts, you take the 240? Because, I mean, I'm on the fence on both of those. Um, I'm I'm taking a 145 um, merino long uh, zip tee merino long sleeve. I'm taking two of them, um, and I'm considering just watching the weather. And if it's looking like it's warm, I'm probably just going to take the 97. Um, and if it's looking like you know lots of rain and you know nastier weather, I'll probably take the 240. Is that kind of how you play it as well? Yeah. So um, the 97. So I don't double up on anything on my system except for. There, there's there's only a couple things that I will take an extra of. Um, I will take an extra pair of underwear. I will take um, you know obviously an extra a couple extra pairs of socks, which we'll get into. Um, I take the 240 on pretty much everything. Um, the 97 is the one thing. If you're going to experience some warm weather, um, I'll take the 97. It's 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 obviously breathes better. The 240 is a is a bonded fabric, so it's um, highly windproof and uh, or highly wind resistant. And so I'll, I'll take that. I, I generally won't take two hoodies, but um, I like to have enough to where I can sleep in something different. If, if I get soaked, if I were to fall down, um, if it's just been a wet day, whatever, I like to have something where, you know, I, that 97 Peloton, I'll sleep in that, and then, you know, wear the 240, it depends. I'll either take, um, like, I've worn the 97 as a base layer as well. So if I don't take, so I have, on, like on the get list, I sent you two 125 Merino short sleeve. This was um, what I took last year when it was really hot up in British Columbia. Um, but like this this fall, I may take a 97, a 240, and I won't take an extra Merino. I'll take a Merino long sleeve, yeah. depending on the weather when I get down to it. So I try not to double up on anything. 
Um, but that 97 Peloton, if I am going to take an extra mid layer, base layer, that's kind of really universal, and I, I, I really like it. I've been running that for two years, I think, more than two years. And so that's the one at only six ounces. I'll, I'll actually, if I'm going to take something extra, that's what I'll take. And then I noticed you're running the, the uh, 125 Merino short sleeve. Um, I typically wear long sleeves just from a sun protection standpoint. Um, is there any reason why, obviously you just said the short sleeve was from your British Columbia list. Um, obviously I have the short sleeve shirts, but honestly I just don't wear, outside I don't wear short sleeves very often. I'm just curious if there was a specific reason why, you know, you definitely went with the short sleeve over just, you know, a zip T145. I tend to sweat out my base layer pretty good, so I like to short sleeve as thin as I can get. I can take that thing off in the evening, like I said, throw on my 97 next to skin, hang that thing up and dry it out really quick. I like Merino next to skin for the antimicrobial. For I, I don't stink as much when I have Merino next to skin, as thin as we can get. Now, I like to go synthetic after that um, for the... Um, I, I just I like merino super thin base layer and then synthetic second layer. That's my personal preference. There's a lot of guys that like a merino base layer or a synthetic base layer and then merino second layer. Again, this this is personal preference. And if, if you don't wear a short sleeve very much, I would I would take a long sleeve. I mean that's again personal preference. Okay, um, the attack glove and the Peloton 200 glove. Um, I'm I'm torn between the guide glove and the attack glove. I have both, and I love those Peloton 200 gloves. Um, just just want your opinion on why the attack and not say the guide glove. They're based, you know they're very similar. Um, one is a little bit lighter, um, a little more dexterity. I would say on the attack glove. Um, I just put the attack glove on there. That's what I wore last year. I sometimes I'll take the guide glove, which is a slightly warmer. Um, a lot of it depends on the fit, which one you like better. Um, the Peloton 200 glove is just a—it's a really nice glove. If you know, just when you're sitting up class and just take the take the cold off you or whatever. But it, it and it doesn't weigh hardly anything. There's a few things you throw in there, like a neck gaiter. I haven't always had that. You know, use that on the hunt. Sometimes I'll take the 200. Those things don't hardly weigh anything. I mean, you're talking two ounces, and you know, and it's kind of dual purpose. You can wrap something up in it if you're not using it. You know, whether it's your camera or anything else. So um, that kind of stuff again is just personal preference. I mean, we make um, pretty much everything from the thinnest, hottest weather all the way to you know as cold as you want to go, especially in the glove thing. So it just boils down to personal preference. If your if your hands were always cold. You may even want to take an insulated glove. I mean, if you're just like, man, if it gets a little bit cold, I'm always freezing. You Arizona guys, you Southwest guys are dying <laughs> in the cold. You, you, you could be. I mean, again, it's just, that's why, you know, one thing when you're looking at these gear lists is like, there is no magic bullet. I mean, I get the question all the time, like, what's the best jacket? Well, it depends on what you're doing, and it depends on what your your body type. It depends on your exertion. It depends on the terrain. It depends on just so many different things. So, like, everybody's looking for a magic bullet, but that's why you got to go out and use all this stuff and kind of see what you like and, you know, the fit and everything else is, you know, there's a lot of different products, and especially, you know, a lot of stuff that we make that is not similar, but, you know, it, depending on how you like to use it will be more fitted for you. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Peloton 240 Beanie is one of my favorite pieces. I love that. I always have that on. Oh, yeah. um, you know, do you, do you anticipate uh, that's more to carry in your pack, and if you you know get up glassing and all of a sudden the wind starts blowing, you put that on to kind of glass, right, and potentially sleep in? Yeah, I mean, of all the, yeah, potentially sleep in, you know, I put my, you know, put it in. The, I, I carry everything in a small little baggie, all that stuff, in, in the top of my pack. But I've never been on a sheep hunt where it was just nice the whole time. Never happened right. to me. I'd love to do one that was like that. But you're going to see some heavy rain. You're going to get cold. Um, you're going to see some high wind, especially you're getting up high. I mean, that's yeah, just stuff to keep warm. Um, I, there, there's a few things that you know you don't want to skimp on something that weighs next to nothing that could keep you warm when when you're going to be miserable. Um, it's not that much to carry. And, you know, again, it's kind of like picking the hunt you're going on. You're going on an unsupported backpack hunt. When I say unsupported, I mean, like, you can't change your system or or bail on the hunt or, or you know, if you get totally soaked and freezing cold, 
you know, without a huge logistical intervention, nothing is going to change on what you're carrying, which would be different than if you were going on a two-day backpack hunt where you were going to, like, yeah, I'm going way in there, but, if man, if everything goes bad and it just gets totally cold and it gets wet and rainy and I just I totally mess up, walk I can walk out. out. You can't. Right. This is an unsupported backpack hunt. You, the, the logistical inter intervention to get you out of there is just not going to happen. Your, your system can't change. So I err on the side of caution on those type of hunts. I mean, especially like when you when you go on the Chugach, that is a walk-in hunt, but you're going to walk in for 18 hours. But, well, that's, yeah. that's, I mean, you're basically, if you, if you decide you're walking out, your hunt is done. It's over. Yeah. Same with, you know, if you call Tavis and say, man, I'm soaked and I'm cold and I hate this and like, you got to come get me. <laughs> your hunt's probably over. So I always err on the side of caution. Like if you think, well, I might need that. And again, that can get you both ways too. You don't want to err too far on it, but when it comes to something like a beanie where it's like, man, I could get a little cold, I'd definitely go with that, you know, something that's going to keep you warmer. Yeah. Uh, Kuyu cap, that's self-explanatory. Merino neck gaiter, I love wearing the neck gaiters. I wear them, I was wearing it this morning fishing. I just, I like keeping the sun off me. Um, one question I had is the mosquitoes are apparently going to be um, pretty good this year, pretty, pretty bad actually. Um so I'm thinking merino neck gaiter. My one question I have for you is: Do you ever wear any type of um, head net of of any type if the bugs are really bad? Like I'm thinking merino neck gaiter and potentially the head net if it gets horrible. I have taken a small head net with me when I hear that it's going to be horrible with bugs. I have on a goat hunt twice, um, and that's when you're just bust busting brush and the bugs are just absolutely insane. Um, bug spray is. I mean, if it's that bad, I would definitely get some bug spray, like when you're up there, get a camp or whatever. I mean, that, that definitely helps. But you hope it's not that bad, and you hope you can camp somewhere where they're not absolutely just insane. But it, it can be terrible, especially early. Um, a lot of the stuff later, you don't really deal with that. The, the black flies can be terrible, uh, especially when the sun really comes out and, there's, and it's totally still and stagnant and no, no wind is moving. They can be pretty fierce, too. So, yeah, it's something you we'll definitely want to consider. Okay, the next thing is Super Down Pro jacket and Super Down pant. I've got that Super Down pa uh, pant, um, and I'm going back and forth between taking my Super Down Pro or taking um, the uh, the Super Ultra the Plain Super Ultra. Yeah. My question um, for you would be, what in your mind, what would put what would throw you over the top, um, whether you take the Ultra or take the Super Down Pro? I mean, Ultra is going to save you a little bit of weight. Um, again, I, I there are a few things in my system that I'd say, like, it's worth the extra weight. I like the more durability of the Super Down Pro jacket and the Super Down Pro pant. Um, I keep these in a medium roll-top gear bag in the bottom of my pack 100% of the time, no matter what. I mean, those, those are my... That's my insurance right there. And I Like, on the, on the brown bear hunt, for example, after I killed my bear... We were stuck out six miles from camp, got down to 26 degrees. You throw that stuff on, I mean, I think that's six times in the last eight years I've slept out where you just make a play on an animal and it just doesn't work out to get back to camp. And that takes a night that would be totally miserable if you were just, you know, didn't have anything that was insulated and makes it, ah, it sucks, but it's not it's not horrible and, you know, you can stay warm enough and you ride it out till the morning and you're fine. I mean, that's, I, I always have that as an insurance policy, especially, and in, in the shoe guys, I would take as warm a stuff as you can take. In July and NWT, the Ultra is going to be fine for you. Um, it just depends on, I, I guess a lot of people would depend on what they own right now. Um, if you already own one, I mean, I, I don't, you know, we'd love to have you buy a second one, but <laughs> I don't know how they, <laughs> you, you need it. Um, and, but, you know, it just depends on, and a lot of it is watching the weather. I mean, if you if you see, like, yeah, we're going to have, you know, the most, you know, super unusual this year. We're going to have really, really, really hot weather like we had in British Columbia last year. Well, I didn't use it that much there. But um, if you're going to have, you know, I did that goat hunt in 2011 where we had 80 to 100-mile-hour winds. It was tearing out monster trees in downtown Anchorage. Like, it was just crazy. Like, ah, it was pretty, that was pretty cold for that time of year. So it just depends. Um, I always err on the side of caution with the, I, I literally, I can't recall a hunt in the last, boy, a long time that I didn't have a super, you know, super down jacket and pant in my pack, always, you know, in a waterproof dry bag that I'm carrying with me. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's, let's move on to the bottoms. 
so you've got the let's see here you've got the uh, Chugach rain pant uh, you've got Tiburon or attack pant uh, 97 Peloton full zip long underwear uh, Peloton 130 briefs uh, Kuyu ultramarino socks uh, thin merino sock liner Yukon gator scarp scarper rebel cape boot so back to the Chugach rain pants. You already said that that's always in your pack on, on a backpack hunt, so we don't need to cover that. Um, I'm back and forth between Tiburon or an attack pant. Obviously, there's a handful of other pants that could, could apply. Uh, again, I want to take the Tiburon. Um, that's, that's what I really want to take. But talk to me about your uh thought process on between the Tiburon and the attack. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got enough stuff, especially if you're taking super down pants, and, you know, you could take the Tiburon on that July hunt for sure. Um, I, I took it uh, in British Columbia in 2014 on a stone sheep hunt. Didn't regret it. I've had two stone sheep hunts, uh, the one in last year in B.C. and the one in the Yukon 2013, where I wish I'd had Tiburon. If you know it's going to be really hot, um, obviously it's that's 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 the pan I would take. I'm, I'm going to take those in my... That's probably one of the only things I'll have doubled up on in my um, in my stuff that I pack when I head to the Yukon this year. And if it looks like it's going to be super warm or uh, you know really nice for ten days, that's probably what I'll take. Is because I get I get super, I get pretty warm. Um, we have another pan that just came out, which is a pro pan, which is like the you know just a little heavier duty version of the attack pan with a knee pad. Again, if you like a knee pad, um, the nice thing about our attack pan and pro pan. And, Tiburon is they got the hip vents. You know, the attack pan is great. I've used that on the majority of my hunts. Um, you can vent them. Um, it, just, it just depends. Again, that's kind of watching the weather. And then, you know, if you're getting, if you're going on a hunt towards, like, in the Chugach, you know, towards September, and it looks like it's going to be terrible, and you're going to see some snow, you know, some of the heavier duty pants are probably going to be better for you. You know, again, yeah, a lot I'd of that probably take the guide the pan on that, I would think. Yeah, uh, that the new pad that we have coming out is called the Talus, which is really going to be nice. It's waterproof knees and, and butt with a knee pad like the Pro. So really nice pad. Okay, cool. I, I wore it like 100 days last year. So that was the one when we were hunting, uh, when you were up last year on the CA, that was that prototype I was wearing. Okay, okay. Uh, 97 Peloton full zip long underwear. I mean, that's like a, a must-have on every Or 200. Again, if it's getting really, really cold, the 200 Peloton, or if you prefer Merino, if you want to do the, the 210 Merino, um, again, a lot of that stuff is just personal preference. I, I found the 97 to be just right for what I'm doing almost all the time um, until I'm throwing the Super Down Pan on. So I really like those. Uh, Yukon Gator, um, that's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, you're going to wear those Gators on all your mountain hunts. Uh, let, let's talk about the, for, for people that um, haven't heard some of these other podcasts I want to talk real fast these Yukon Gators um, and I was messing with them yesterday so you've obviously got you know whatever pant you're wearing your Tiburon your Attack your Pro Pant whatever um, and then you know your your Scarpa you know Rebel Cave boots um, and then you go with the with the Rain Pant and then you go with the um, Yukon uh, Gator over the top, and someone had recommended getting a couple of uh, uh, Velcro, lightweight Velcro straps, which I did, um, which Kuyu, obviously the Yukon Gator has a, a nice tightening strap on the top, um, but have you ever run any t anything else on the Gator to, to make it extra waterproof on the creek crossings? Yeah, I, I can take some straps with me that go around. So you, the, the key is to have your pant go down over the collar of your boot, the rain pant to go down over the top of your boot all the way to your laces, yeah. your gator to go over the top. So that's that's a that's a that's basically wrapped going up and down. And then you want to cinch that strap around your gator, which is around your collar of your boot. Um, and so again, it's going to prevent water from coming up from the bottom. Which the Yukon Gator House design is—it's—it's it's stretch. It's got some stretch to it, so it should fit tight to your boot. Um, when you suck that thing down, it should be—you know—not. It, it should seal up to your boot. So you're gonna—that's going to be one prevention level from coming in through the through the bottom, and then the um, rain pant, and then from the top where you sit, cinch it down at the top above the calf. 
and the rain pant, and where they're all where all that comes together at your boot. Again, the, your regular pants going down, your rain pants going down, the gaiters coming up. If you cinch that around the collar of your boot, um, you're going to be able to move across fairly deep. You know, like up to your knees, maybe a little bit higher, as long as you're moving pretty quickly. Um, and you're, and again, are you going to be totally dry? If you do it right, you can be. Or is it going to prevent you from getting totally soaked? Yes. It it just allows you to move through something that's not. Now, if you have to stop and wait it and and really slow down, you're going to get wet. Um, but if you can move fairly quickly, um, and, and again, you don't have to run. Um, but if you can move fairly quickly, I've waded some pretty big streams where you don't get wet at all. So. Good stuff. Uh, good stuff there for sure. All right, let's um, talk about the uh, Rebel K boots. Um, I talked in another podcast. Um, I actually went up a half a size um, and just loving those um, Rebel K boots. Can't wait, wait to wear them uh, on this hunt. Uh, have you noticed also um, having to go up a half a size uh, on those boots? Yeah, I've I've been a half a size bigger on pretty much every Euro boot that I've ever worn, so that's just kind of how it is. Um, and it's, again, that just depends on fit. Um, the really nice thing about that boot is that if you get totally soaked, it's going to dry a lot faster than a standard leather boot, and it's not and it's not going to change sizes on you. It's not going to stretch out like a like a typical leather boot. So I've been I, I could not have more good things to say about that boot. I. That's that's the end all be all as far as sheep hunting boots as far as I'm concerned. But you know, again, if you have a boot that fits you really well, I wouldn't change. If you like a boot a lot, you know, 50% of the equation is your foot. So that's what I always tell guys. You know, we, that's the best boot in the world. If it doesn't fit you well, is not going to be the best boot for you. So, right, uh, Brendan, those are obviously synthetic, um, quick drying. Uh, do you treat those at all? Um, with with anything, do you, you know? Do you put any nope. sort of? None. Okay, you never treat nope. them. No, nope. okay. not a synthetic boot. No. Nope. Okay. Um, let's talk about in your pack. Uh, your, you you put Icon Pro fifty two hundred or Icon Pro seventy two hundred, or, um, or the Ultra seven thousand, or the Ultra six thousand. And again, that that's going to boil down to preference, like how you like to pack, whether you really prefer a minimalist. Um, I like the Icon Pro for carrying a bow. Like this one I'm going on, I'm, I'm carrying a bow. I like the Icon Pro. I think it carries a bow a little better. It's got more attachment points. Um, a lot of guys like the the Ultra, the minimalist pack, especially on a bigger expedition like this, where you don't have as you don't need as many pockets. You're kind of more well laid out. You don't need, you need everything to have a place. You know, so it just again that's a personal preference and depends on how much stuff you're taking too. The bigger the pack, um, if you're going ten days and you're carrying all ten days worth of food on your back and your tent and your sleeping bag and all that stuff, all your gear, you're gonna need the bigger pack. If um, you know, this boils down to knowing what kind of a hunt you're going on too. Just like asking, like if if you're going with your guide and you guys are sharing a tent. I um, mean, you don't have to carry a tent. You go. You you may only need fifty two hundred if you're getting a five day food drop. If you're only carrying five days worth of food and you're sharing a tent and your guide's packing the stove, um, you might not need as big a pack. So, again, it's just kind of knowing exactly what you're doing. Uh, bow, bow holder, glassing pad, um, pack rain cover. Obviously, those are uh, the glassing pad is great because you don't end up ripping your pants. And if it's really wet, you could potentially keep yourself dry. Yeah, you uh, slide it in between the frame and your you slide it in between the frame and the bag on the pack. And I've always got it's just a nice extra piece. The pack rain cover, I take. Um, um, we'll get down here a little bit, but like everything I have in my pack is in a waterproof bag. Everything, one hundred percent. Like I have nothing in my bag can get in my pack can get wet. Um, I, all my all my gear has its own dry bag roll top dry bag, zip dry bag, everything is in. But I do take a rain cover. A lot of times I don't want, you know, if it's really raining hard or whatever, I like to keep, leave my pack outside my tent, you know. So the, the the pack rain cover, you can just leave it out. Or if you're sitting glass and, uh, you know, you cover your stuff up so, you know, your actual pack doesn't get soaked. But, you know, at the end of the day, you, you're going to need everything to be in its own waterproof bag in your pack. Okay, and then one quick question. You said you like it to be outside your tent. With the Mountain Star two-person tent, do you normally set the pack, like, outside of your tent, or do you set it inside where 
you know the you know the zipper comes down and there's the open you know it's totally in the covered bedroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah if, I, if I've got my own tent, um, if I'm packing my own tent, not not sharing a tent, depends on you know again like how much you guys hunt, you'll be you'll be sharing a tent on the NWT hunt. I assume you're going to take your own tent. Um, yeah, you throw in your vestibule. You got two. That's that's great. Um, Sometimes, you know, if everything is totally soaked and you're taking your boots off and there's two of you in a tent, it's nice to be able to just, everything you're not going to use in a night, set it out under your, inside your bag and then put your rain cover on it. And if it pounds for two days where the rain, it's not going to be just sopping wet, you know. Right. Uh, 15 or 30 degree super down sleeping bag. Uh, I would assume on the NWT hunt, I take the 30 on the Chugach, take the 15, possibly the zero, just depending on what the conditions are looking like. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that, again, that's worst, worst case scenario type stuff. Like what, what is, what is, you know, in July, you're not going to see something that's going to be, you know, and again, you have your super down pro jacket and pant, you know, that makes your bag into a basically a zero degree bag, you know, if it got really cold. Um, but in the shoe gas, you could see three days of horrible snow and it could freeze and uh, it, it can be really, really nasty. So, you know, again, if you, if you never get cold sleeping out, you can go lighter. If you, if you tend to run pretty cold, I'd err on the side of a warmer bag. Okay. Um, Neo Air sleeping pad, that's the same one I have. Um, platypus, three liter water bladders. Uh, Havilon, uh, 1068 blades, same thing I use. Uh, the Petzl uh, reactic headlamp, uh, long spoon, one liter bottle, uh, water bottle. I, I assume you're taking the algae. I actually don't. I take a, uh, I take, I, I, I've actually gotten to where I take two. Um, one liter Gatorade bottle. They have a they have a smaller they 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 weigh half and uh, I take one um, one inside my pack and then one outside and I just I don't know I started carrying a Gatorade bottle instead of a um, an algae in a long time ago. But I mean again you just need something that you can you can drink out of a stream real quick. You can fill up real quick. Um, I uh, I use one of the Gatorade bottles as a as a pee bottle at night. Um, Paul Bright taught me this trick. You know, the first time we ever hunted with him, he's like, man, I can't believe all you hunters get out and take a whiz at night. Like, it's insane. He's like, yeah. mountain climbers, you know, they always have a pee bottle with them. And you know, once they started using that, I mean, it sounds a little gross, but it's uh, it's actually pretty amazing. MVP on some of the hunts, especially if you're stuck for, you know, obviously you're in your own tent and two days in there, you <laughs> want to climb out and get wet. Um, it's it's uh, it's pretty nice. So, um, but yeah. Just, Make sure I, you don't you know, mix up your mix up your pee bottle and your water bottle right <laughs> there's one that is clearly marked with a uh with a black <laughs> marker of which you on his which so. uh, um i noticed you you say long spoon um do, do you ever use the spork where it's a spoon and fork or you know i didn't know if long spoon meant it's specifically a spoon or do you use yeah the so rei has these really long spoons you can buy them if you google you know a long camping spoon but you know anybody who's eating a lot of mountain house realizes that they're about two inch any spoon you get that's regular is about two inches too short so i don't know how long they are they're like gotta be a foot long maybe 13 inches 14 inches long but it's a real long spoon it's plastic so that you can get your stuff out of your mountain house without getting your knuckles in in uh in your yeah all i the hate time. getting all yeah getting all yeah okay um seven roll top dry bags two small three medium two large Yep, everything in my pack is in a dry bag. Like I said, I mean nothing. I mean whether it's my camera gear, um, my incidentals, my personals, my extra clothes, anything I take off that I'm putting back. You know, unless I'm going to use it shortly, I put it back in, in, in a dry bag because you, you're gonna stuff's gonna get wet. I mean my sleeping bag is 100% in a in a in a dry bag every every single time. Um, a couple years ago when we were in the Yukon or in, in British Columbia. My tent got flipped over. We were, we were goat hunting one of the nastiest days I've ever been hunting in, and my tent got flipped over. And luckily, I had put my, and it just got soaked. My Everything in my tent just got absolutely soaked. It, it blew over. We had a big gust of wind, and it ripped all my stakes out and flipped my tent over, and it was just hanging upside down and turned into basically a water funnel upside down. And luckily, I put everything back in a in a dry bag, and, I mean, it, it, it averted what could have been a potentially a pretty dangerous situation because, you know, had my sleeping bag been 
left out and all my gear had been left out and all my extras. We got back and we, you know, really pushed it hard that day and I was sweated, soaked to the bone, all that stuff. Like, you want to make sure anything you can keep dry, you keep dry. You just never know. That was one thing on that goat hunt last year. I, every time I left my tent, I put my sleeping bag and rolled it up in the dry bag so that, yep. you know, just what you're saying. Um, two zip, tri- zip dry bags, a small boned out meat bag, medium bone, bone in uh, meat bag, uh, two carbon trekking poles, and the Mountain Star two-person tent. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the meat the meat bags are uh, you know anything you can do that has dual use or triple use is awesome and th- that's a classic example right there. So my food I break down into which we'll get into I break down into two five day packs. I, I basically pack five days and five days and I put them in the small boned out meat bag um, and you know put those in my pack so they're easier to pack. Um, you can you know it's obviously easier to find a good place for something if there's two smaller. Um, two smaller packages of your food and you can put one on each side or one at the front or one on the top, however it goes. But the nice thing about those um, bone out meat bags, I take, um, obviously, once you get towards the end of your hunt, it's going to be, one of them's going to be empty or, you know, you're going to take your food out as you eat it. Um, obviously, it can be used as a meat bag, which is what it's actually for. So there's a second use, obviously, meats, you know, food storage, packing out meat on your way out. And the third thing is I use that small one. Um, I put my super down or extra clothes or whatever in it at night and it makes a really nice pillow nicer than a still nylon dry bag so I mean there's a, there's a three use thing I used to take a pillow um, so that that's that's why I take those and then the the bone in bag the, the the medium bone in bag I take for whether you're taking out the cape or the rest of the meat but that's pretty much what you need for an entire sheep you well let me see we, I think we can cover that when we get to food yep. uh, trekking poles or an ice axe um, how often do you take an ice axe? How often do you take trekking poles? And what makes the difference in deciding what you're going to take? I've, I've kind of went 50 50. Um, I prefer trekking poles, um, and I always miss having an ice axe, if that's, that's not the easiest answer. But <laughs> I, I like hiking with two trekking poles. I feel like it's more efficient. I feel like I, I don't work as hard. Every single time I don't take an ice axe, I regret it because you're digging. You know, I got to go borrow somebody. You know, Jason usually it always takes an ice axe, and I'm always hey, can I borrow your ice axe to dig out my spot? I always regret not taking an ice axe, and especially if you fall down and break a trekking pole, which I've done basically on a lot of different hunts, whether it's in between a rock or something. But I'm going to take an ice axe on this one. Um, in the Chugach, you're definitely going to want to take an ice axe. In the NWT, you know, it's a little more forgiving country. It's a little more open and rolling. Um, if you like using trekking poles, that that'd be a good good place to use them. So, if that's not really a, a definitive answer, but um, and especially if you're in really steep steep country where there's not a lot of great places to camp, take an ice axe, um, a telescoping ice axe. So you can use it as a you know as basically like a single trekking pole, and then you can dig out your camp spot. There's a, there's a lot of time in really really steep country where you just can't find a nice flat spot, and you're just going to dig one out. So. Let's talk about the Mountain Star tent um, compared to the Storm Star tent. I would assume on 90% of your backpacking hunts, you're going to take the Mountain Star tent. What would be the condition where you would switch to the Storm Star? Um, I always take the Storm Star to Alaska. Um, I've seen some conditions in Alaska that are just, or especially like your July hunt in NWT. Take the Mountain Star, it's great. I'd take the aluminum poles versus the carbon. If you do break a carbon pole, it's, you know, it's more catastrophic than if, you know, aluminum can be rebent. And again, it's always kind of a freak thing, whether it's a big, uh, you know, a super high gust of wind, something falling on it, or generally somebody stepping on it, which, you know, again, most of the time when poles get broke, it's good from pilot error. Um, and then when, I, when you're talking Alaska, like I'm not sure you guys, you're going to take the, the Storm Star. I don't, I don't hunt Alaska without taking a four season tent. I just, I've had too many times where stuff, you know, you thought it was going to be nice and it just turned out to be horrible. So um, that's kind of what I do. I'm going to take the Mountain Star to the Yukon. Um, I took it last time. It was, it was fine. Um, but if you could see really, really bad weather or as it gets later season where you could see a big dump of snow or something, I, I err on the side of caution, especially, again, when we're talking about an unsupported backpack hunt, um, you don't want something to fail on you. So err on the side, you know, something that could save your life, like a tent, I would err on the side of caution. 
um, versus you know early season in July. You're you're not going to see that kind of stuff in July. Do you treat the tent at all? Um, I've had great success with my Mountain Star nope. two-person tent. Um, you don't treat it. You don't nope. do anything to it. Okay. It's already got a DWR on it. It's already seam tape and waterproof. Um, I've seen, you know, you'll you'll see some tents that have some failures. You know, guys will get bug spray or gasoline on them or something. And they'll eat through it, but no, that, that should be. It's ready to go right right when you buy it. Okay, and I also have the floor. Um, I, I'm not sure what you actually call it, but it's a tent floor. Yeah. Um, do you always put that underneath the tent? I don't. I, I, in fact, I haven't taken a floor. That's just one of those things where, um, you know, you might get a hole in the bottom. You might have to replace the tent more frequently if that happens, but it's just something that I just haven't taken that often. Um, it's nice to have. Um, I just, I generally haven't. Uh, um, it'll definitely extend the life of your tent. Um, you can, you know, you'll, you'll wear, you'll wear a tent out faster without using uh, the floor, but, you know, it just depends. That's one of those things where um, if you, it depends on if you like that, so. Okay, let's talk optics and gear. Um, you've got the Kuyu Bino system with rangefinder holder. You're taking the Swarovski 10 by 42s. Um, that's exactly what I'm taking as well. Um, you talk about a two lens cleaner, uh, loop hold RX 1200 rangefinder. That's what I'm taking. And Swarovski 95 uh, uh, ATX uh, spotting scope, um, outdoorsman's tripod with Manfrotto RC2 head. Uh, Sony A65 camera, Iridium 955 sat phone, and iPhone with phone scope. Let's back up to the binoculars. I'm taking the 10 by 42 uh, EL binoculars as well. Um, is there any sheep hunt when you're not taking the 1042s? Maybe you go with the 15s, or are you always just taking 1042s and you feel like for doll sheep, you know, you, they're such a you know, good binocular, good wide range, you know, field of view. Um, is that plenty of binocular for, you know, you spot something, you automatically, I assume you're going right to your spotter. Yeah, I tried taking a set of 15s on a stone sheep on and hand holding them. Um, it just, it was just a little, they were just a little too much. So I, I tend to go with the 10s. Obviously, most of the time I'm bow hunting anyway. So I like um, a little bigger field of view. Doll sheep in general, you're going to have, you know, again, we're talking about judging them and counting rings and all that stuff. You're going to have to get fairly close. You're going to have to identify that sheep. So, you know, it's not like glassing up coos deer with 15s or something like that. Um, you know, again, if you just love glassing with 15s, that'd be a personal hit in your gear list. You go like, you know what, I just can't go without 15s. And there's some guys that would say that. Um, I Like, a lot of guys take a 65. I prefer a 95. Um, it's a little more weight for sure. I prefer a little heavier tripod. I love looking for sheep myself. Um, I, I've i found that the bigger the spotting scope, the less I've had to walk. Like there's, you know, sometimes you can identify a ram from a long ways away and it's like, well, we got to go get way closer and you can really sit down and get it if it's super clear and with the 95 you can go like, nope, he's not what we think he is or, yep, we got to go get a closer look at it and it can save you some walking or it can identify something that you might walk past. So that's why I tend to go that way with the with the really, you know, high-end glass. And, and again, you you know, guides don't make a pile of money. It's um, not every guide has a $5,000 spotting scope. So I always tell everybody, you know, like if you have a really nice spotter that you really like, you can take it up there with you. And if it's better than your guides, um, swap it out and have him carry yours. You know, that, that's... Um, that's one of the cool things, but yeah, not not every guide has a five thousand uh, um, dollar ninety five setup. But uh, if they don't, you know, they can definitely take yours. Or you know, again, the best glass combined you guys have. That's that's what I take. Well, that was one thing I was I was thinking of taking the sixty five millimeter. But now that you say it, I might should take my ninety five millimeter. And then when I get up there, you know, see what see what my guide has. And if I say, hey, I've got the 95 here, they may look at it with their eyes bulging out if he doesn't have it and be like, yeah, we're taking that for sure. I mean, would it, would it be your impression that the guy, if he doesn't have it, would be like, yeah, I'll take that, I'll carry that for sure, like they, they see the value in having the 95? Maybe, or they'll, or they'll go, man, that thing's way too big, and no, we don't need it. You know, <laughs> that's kind of up to him. But for me, the, the 95, I mean, it's just a, you know, it's an incredible piece of glass. and. Um, yeah, I guess that's 
there, there are just a few things in everyone's setup where they're going to have to make the call. Like, is that worth the extra weight to me? Um, you know, again, that's that's one of the things. Whether it's um, you know, like the Super Down Pro, yeah, it's worth a little bit extra me. The glass, for sure, a little bit heavier tripod. Yep, really good camera. Yep, that's worth it extra me. Everything else, I'm going as light as possible. And there's a lot of stuff where people will be like, man, I would never leave without this, and I won't even take it. So, those are the things you got to yep. look at on your thing. And just you know, is that important to you? Let's take a quick break here again uh, to hear from our sponsors, and then I want to talk a little bit about Glossy. Guys, what an awesome opportunity I'm about to tell you about. The Go Hunt Insider is offering a 30-day free trial of Western Hunting's best research resource. All you got to do to start your 30-day free trial is go to gohunt.com forward slash j scott you'll see a blue box that says start your free 30-day trial click on that box uh, you'll get a chance to check out the filtering 2.0 you'll get a chance to check out the states the units the different animals uh, this is a free trial you'll be able to see draw odds uh, you'll see the complete coverage of 4200 different profiles units species and seasons um, there's additional benefits to being an insider member. You can have access to all the strategy articles. So now remember, for free, you're going to get to check this out for 30 days. Also, you'll be able to see the monthly giveaways, and you'll check out the Go Hunt Gear Shop, the insider. Uh, you'll see how the insider points work with the gear shop. So money that you're already spending on gear can be used at the Go Hunt Gear Shop. Guys, check out Go Hunt Insider. It's a 30-day free trial. Go to gohunt.com forward slash jscott and take advantage of this awesome opportunity. Guys, I'd also like to thank kuyu.com. That's K-U-I-U.com. Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Obviously, Brendan Burns on this podcast episode uh, is doing a great job breaking down the doll sheep uh, gear that he's taking on his hunt. And Kuyu is, makes the best ultralight hunting gear on the market today. Go to kuyu.com, K-U-I-U.com to check them out. Guys, I want to thank the Optics Authority, the Outdoorsmans.com, for their sponsorship of this podcast. You can go to 1 800 291 8065, or you can go to Outdoorsmans.com, use the J Scott promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all Outdoorsmans products. Okay, Brendan, I want to ask you a quick question about um, obviously, I've never seen a doll sheep. You know, I can glass pretty well. Um, it's the white one. It's the white one. It, 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 from a strategy standpoint of glassing, um, obviously you're going to be dro- I'm going to be dropped off probably in a glaciated valley. We're going to walk up, you know, up up a river or down a river, um, and you're going to be kind of looking up both sides. Um, you know, is there anything that you're like, oh, I see this. I'm looking there first. You know, like first glance type of thing. I'm going to check this or that for doll sheep, or do you just start at the top and start glassing down or start at the bottom and start looking up? Or, I, you know, do you see gr- green grass up high and you automatically look at that or what? Yeah, I mean, everybody has a different glassing style. I, I, I tend to go to the skyline first just for the obvious stuff or something that could be popping over that you're just going to catch at the end. I mean, I, I run the skyline first and then start, you know, whether it's gridding or... Whatever. And, and, and again, the more you hunt them, the more you go, that looks pretty sheepy or that's, but you want to look at everything. I mean, you, you know, like, especially like in the Chugach, you're going to see, there can be some sheep really, really way down low, like crazy low, like, like, man, I can't believe there's sheep down there, but they, you know, they don't eat rocks, they eat grass. So, um, you know, a lot of people, they want to, you know, a lot of guys want to just glass super up high and, you know, up in the rocks and, and they, they do like to bed in the rocks and they like to disappear into some stuff where there's nothing to eat, but, you know, they, they do eat grass. So, um, you gotta, you gotta basically look at all over. Doll sheep you're gonna, you're gonna find are not as hard to spot as any, any of the other sheep. You know, obviously you're like used to picking up big horns and, you know, if they didn't have white butts, none of us might get them, you know, so, right. um, the doll sheep, you know, they're they're not particularly hard to find, which is why I would say, you know, if you were going stone sheep hunting, there was a lot of timber. Taking 15s might not be a bad idea, but doll sheep hunting, like, it's really once you identify what you're looking for, then you got to get up close, and that's when you use your bigger glass. But um, they're they're generally pretty easy to pick up. I wouldn't say 
a given, but, you know, it's a big white animal on a green or black. So if they do blend in, you know, for being white, they're they're surprisingly hard to see, too, at times. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, you're just going to want to look it all over. Okay, and then another question I have is, um, so we're walking up or down a valley. How often is it where you set up, you know, you, you set up a camp and you hunt from that, you know, camp a day or two and then you keep moving? Or in your mind, is it you always have your, you know, your camp on your back, everything you brought is with you at all times, um, you know, or do you move down a valley, set it, you know, set your stuff and hike up, you know, to glass and look and then come back down to a tent? I mean, how does it normally work? Yeah, it's going to depend on scenario. I mean, and it's you guys, you'll probably have a set camp, you know, based on when you, you know, as far as leaving camp and just going with your hunting setup, that, that kind of more occurs when you have a ram found that you're actually hunting. Um, you may be camped out for four or five days on a ram over the ridge waiting for him to get into, you know, that that can happen. Like, that's that's kind of how it happened. Most of the time I've got, until you find a sheep, you've got your camp on your back, especially on the hunts you're going on. You're, you're moving, you know, I rarely leave my pack anywhere and go, you know, it seems like if you leave it, you're going to be um, walking back downhill to pick it up. You might as well have taken it with you. So, um, no, I mean not, like my, you know, tent, all my, you know, all of that stuff. Is there ever a time where you're, you know, you're just going to leave, you know, either set up a tent or leave your stuff, and then you're going to go kind of day, you know, take your pack and most of your stuff, but leave some of the stuff, or is it like if you go anywhere, you take everything with you? Yeah, it's just going to depend. I mean, you, I could see a scenario where, hey, we're just going to pop up this valley for half a day and go check it out and come back. But in general, I don't like to leave my tent. I mean, that's, that's you know, again, you're you're unsupported where, you know, what happens if a big storm rolls in and you're up there and you don't have your tent with you or, you know, like I, unless I'm base camped and probably sitting on a ram, I prefer to have my everything I've got on my back. I mean, the, hey, we'll dump everything here and come back and get it. That just never works out well for me. So yeah. it's kind of like dropping tight. your you're, shoes off. You, you know, yeah. where you drop your shoes to go make a stock, and it's like, oh, I can't even find them. Yeah, I got a, I got a buddy in New Mexico a couple of years ago. Dropped his shoes and uh, ended up walking three and a half miles back to his truck without his shoes on. Couldn't find them. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I like to have everything on my back, just because you never know. Or you could go up a valley and go, okay, we're not going that far. What if you get way up the valley, and all of a sudden six miles down the way there's just a, a sheep that you that's just a monster and you have to go after well if you left your stuff yeah. back and it's your tent and you know you're gonna have to go back and get it i'd, I'd right. rather just move with my stuff on me but you know get your guides and you know they'll, they'll they'll make that call okay uh you've got your personal items you, you say first aid kit tooth toothbrush and paste chapstick vitamins pain reliever lighter and fire starter earplugs 15 foot uh, paracord and sunglasses. Uh, back to the first aid kit. Uh, anything real specific, or just kind of a general first aid kit? You know, yeah, general first aid kit. Mine, mine's refined after I almost cut my finger off in DC last year. I've got I've got a suture kit in there now. I've got um, you know a roll of tape. I've got a lot more stuff than I had last year. Luckily, you know, in, in fact, my my kit was inadequate for seven or eight years, um, and then last year I had a, a pretty big, you know could have been more serious than it was but a giant rock i was trying to move out of everybody's way you know caught my finger and damn near cut cut my middle finger off it was on my third fourth day of the hunt and uh, luckily it was clean it was to the bone on two sides it was pretty nasty and so um i've got a suture kit in there now where it would have been nicer if i'd have sewn this thing up because when i got home they had to recut it and sew it it was kind of a mess for a while but <clears throat> um yeah i mean i i have you know a little thing of neosporin in there um athletic tape, again, I said suture kit, some, some band-aid. I take 10 or 15 band-aids. You just never know when you're going to cut yourself, especially with a Havilon. I've not managed the life size of the sheep without, you know, nipping my finger yet. So um, just enough to where, I mean, you you can't think about something, about enough things that were, if you had, like, a major emergency. I mean, obviously you want enough stuff where if you had something go wrong where poked or, you know, a rock hits you or something, you know, like you can you know, stabilize somebody or whatever. But there's a million things you could take, and, and you can get overly crazy with, with your security-type system, which is your safety kit. But I just take enough for any scenario. Like, I've been hurt, injured, cut, all that kind of stuff enough to where basically anything that's happened in the past I want to have covered. So, yeah. Uh, 
toothbrush and paste, I assume you just take one of those little um, things of toothpaste that, you know, you yeah. usually when you walk out of your dentist, they hand you those little things. Yeah, that's one of those things that's kind of a nice creature comfort. I mean, I, I know guys go 10 days without brushing their teeth. I'm not one of those guys, so. Yeah, the moss growing on your teeth, no thing. Yeah. Uh, chapstick, that's all good I take stuff. a couple chapsticks, by the way. Like, it, 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 when you're going through a lot of water and, and your, my lips start to dry out, like I've almost died from uh, cracking in my lips. I, I, you know, chapstick's one of those things. Like, I'd walk 15 miles one way if I forgot my chapstick, so. Don't forget that. I mean, I, I'm a chapstick. I carry it in my. I carry actually two. I carry one in each pocket. That's kind of a goofy thing to tell about yourself. But I'm a chapstick addict, so I'll definitely take a couple pairs because I'm the same way. Like if I had to go uh, four or five days without chapstick, I mean, it would be ugly. There's a yeah. lot of things I'd rather go without chapstick. I know that sounds crazy. Sunscreen is um, one of those too. I have a little tiny thing of sunscreen. I'll have that on that list. But if if it's going to be warm, especially in July. Um, Bug dope, sunscreen, both of those things would be worth carrying um, if you're going to see both of those. And, and sunscreen, that's obviously a great thing to, to have, you know, your nose, face, you, you know, the stuff up north, it can, it can really fry you. Uh, lighter and fire starter, I would assume you've probably got two small lighters and you've got some sort of fire starter. What yep. typical fire starter do you take? I think it's a little canister thing I've had forever. It's like I think they're like they basically are like cotton balls with some kind of wax or oil on them. And they, or something. yeah, something. They're 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 good. You know, I don't have a ton of that stuff. I mean, I, you know, most of the time if you're going to start a fire, you should be able to, you'll be able to start it with you know just a lighter or whatever. But I have you know enough to where if you had an emergency and needed to get warm, you got enough to where you could get one going if it's if it's really wet. So I don't take, I don't overdo that. That's the kind of stuff where guys can overdo. Um, you know, again, these personals, you, you just want to go through everything and, and, you know, some of the stuff, like, you got to look at it like, am I really going to need that? You know, it's like I have a little thing of fire starter. Do I need a giant one? That would be nice sometimes, but you don't really need it. Yeah. And then the vitamins uh, and the pain reliever, I always tell guys, like, if you normally take vitamins, take them with you. If you normally, you know, take an Advil or two at night or whatever, like, you want to keep everything as consistent as you possibly can. If you take a vitamin every day and you go on a hunt for, you know, 12 days and are doing, you know, high exertion, something that you've never done before, you want to change as few things about your daily routine, especially physically, as you can as you can change. Let's jump into uh, food. Um, you, you talk about two pounds per day. Um, you, you average. 3,565 calories, and then you gave me an example. Um, yep. You talked about a Mountain House entree at 575 calories, uh, Mountain House breakfast or two oatmeals at 500 calories, coffee, 130 calories, two bagel butts, which I assume those are those bagel thins. Yeah, they're thin bagels. Um, um, I thin like bagels, to have yeah. something... You know, again, I like to have something that's that's got a little bite to it. I mean, you can you can go without that, but I just found that I just I just make up that that's that's my limit. I, I eat a lot less than a lot of people. You know, some guys might like this. This might not be enough for somebody, um, but for me, this is plenty. I've done it up to 17 days with with this system, and um, you know, again, this is one of those things. Like, if you don't know how you function on this kind of a food list while you're at home. Go a couple days, try it out. You know, eat a Mountain House. You know, knock down yeah. uh, Mountain House breakfast in the morning. Do, like, eat, try it for a couple days. See how you function on it. Brendan, one question, um, and I'll go through the rest of your food list. Is I, I've had a couple guys actually send me their food list, and they're saying that they go more with like a Pro Bar. Um, you know, in the morning, and they'll actually do like a Mountain House um, breakfast skillet at noon. So for lunch, and then do a mountain house at night. Do you do you typically wake up have? I don't drink coffee, but you you've got coffee on your list. Do you typically have coffee and pound down a, you know, a mountain house um, breakfast, you know, full on breakfast? Or I actually thought maybe the idea of having you know something light because normal uh, my normal day is I normally start light and then I have a lunch and I have a dinner. Just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's great. I mean, to me, I, the stove is only out once a day. It's out at night, and it's out in the morning. 
you know, before it goes back in. So that's that's planning on having your guide dig out of his pack at noon and okay. or you okay. digging out your thing in boiling water. Now, if you want to do that, that's great. Like for me, I, I just assume that we're only going to have hot water in the evening okay. and in the morning. Okay. So that's why I do that. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got unlimited supply of fuel or, you know, a guy, that's how he likes to do it. Hey, man, if, if somebody's going to knock down hot water at noon, I'll drink, I'll drink a hot cocoa or a coffee at noon, too. So I, I just... I just run those two, those two times because that's when I really count on being able to have hot water. And most of the time, we're trying to save fuel, so you're gonna get one big, you know, you're gonna boil one in, in the morning, split it. You're gonna boil one or two at night and fill everybody's mountain house up, and and, and that's the hot water. Okay. Um, several guys have said specifically, like, don't bring a stove because your guide will have a stove, yep. and that's. It would be crazy yep. to take two, and you're you're adamant about that, right? Well, no, I mean, if you, you know, again, if 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 you want to have a coffee multiple times a day, and again, it boils down to what are what are the things that are going to make your hunt better for you? If you if you got to have coffee three times a day, take a small stove as you got, and take a little, um, you know, try and get some canisters up there. The problem with the NWT, not so much on your Chugach hunt. Um, obviously, Lance is going to have a stove, multiple stoves with him. Um, depending on the number of guys that are with you. But in the NWT, is flying with those canisters um, is basically impossible. It's illegal. So um, unless you can get them up there, taking a stove is not that practical unless you have a you know an international stove with fuel and you got to have that thing clean before you go up there. And, you know, so just take that into account. I mean, if, if you want to leave your 95 scope at home and uh, take a stove, yeah, go for it. But you know, <laughs> it's one of those yeah. things for me. I plan on... You know, if if the guides, you know, again, I'll carry the glass, you know, whether it's a bigger glass, and I just count on if, if you know, again, if it's a guided hunt, the guide's got um, the stove, and you try and split that up, up as much as possible. Sometimes if it's one-on-one, like in the Northwest Territories or in BC, like when Jason and I are hunting together, um, we'll have two stoves. Sometimes Jason will bring a stove. Sometimes if there's two guides, which you legally have to have on some of these hunts, um, they'll have two stoves. So it just depends. Okay. You've got here bagel butts, four slices of cheese, 12 slices of Italian salami, two packs of mustard. So I would assume that's kind of your midday. You hit up um, and, and, you know, basically make a sandwich almost, right? Yep, I make a little small sandwich. It's it's kind of something that's normal tasting. It's nice to have. It's two of them. I, I make two of them up at the same time. And when I say salami, like any charcuterie that you buy, um, one thing – when you're buying this stuff that you're going to be carrying for 10 days, anything you can buy that's pre-dried or not in the – basically, I won't put anything in my um, in my food list that is not bought from what I call dry storage or, you know, like when you go to the grocery store, if, if there's salami that's in the refrigerator and you buy it from there, it's going to rot by the time your hunt ends. Whereas if you buy um, from one of the – the, the dry meat counters or something that's not refrigerated is going to be there all the time, um, like pre-dried or, you know, shark, like higher end. It's generally more expensive. Um, that's that's the type of meat that I take because it never goes bad. I mean, it's, I, I've, I mean I've, I've had stuff that will, you know, three weeks later you find one in your pack. It's like, oh, it's still good. Um, and same with cheese. You want to buy cheese from the counter that is, you know, pre-dried or pre-sealed that's not, um, you don't want anything from the actual refrigerated counter at, at the grocery store. So I hope that's cl- I made that clear enough. But basically, if it's you know the higher end cheeses that are naturally moldy or um, come in their own little wheel that you don't have to worry about going bad that you buy that are just sitting out at the grocery store, and the same with the meat. That's the stuff that's going to keep the best on your hunt as well. Whereas if you buy something from the the cold storage, it's going to rot before you, a lot of times by the halfway through your hunt. Right. Yeah. But you say 12 slices, so, I mean, if, if, if I'm on a 10-day hunt, I mean, that's 120 slices. Are, on a 10-day hunt, are you, st- I mean, are you carrying, how are you carrying it, I guess? Are you carrying each day has its own 12 slices? Yeah, in, they're, in they're thin. Own bag? And, again, and, again, it all falls under my, if you go through and get two pounds per day and you got your mountain house and your mountain house breakfast and your coffee and you put all this other stuff together, then I work backwards and you, you weigh your bagel butts and you got two of those. And then you're going to decide, I mean, if, if your salami roll is really small, it might be 20 slices. If your salami roll is pretty big, it might be six slices. So that was just 
you know, an example of what I took to BC last year. But, um, but as I guess far my the, question is, do you take them sliced or do you slice them, do you take a big chunk and slice them there or do you slice them and have them in individual day packs ready to I, go? I slice them and put them in wax paper in a little baggie um, just so I, I have taken it where I've taken like three big rolls and then sliced them up daily, um, but I, I've just found that it, the, the more you can prep it to where everything's in one little bag, that's what you eat that day, and then it's all done, and then you're not, you know, because you get a little bit hungry and like, eh, I'm going to take a little extra slice today or go a little deep yeah. on this one, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> day eight, you got no meat left, so I just break it down every, everything per day. And how much does, you know, because this is a little different than a lot of people, This, how much is having like that, what I would call like real food, like good tasting, like does, is that a game changer for you? It's just what I function better on. I mean, you can go a little bit lighter than this, and you can go, I just don't like a lot of processed stuff. Um, and, and there's just certain things when I'm hunting that I just enjoy more, like like in, you know, in my nut bag, that I have all there with the, my four ounces of nuts and macadamia almond. I put corn nuts in there. There's something about corn nuts for me, barbecue corn nuts or, you know, one of the flavored corn nuts. It just adds a little crunch or it's a little salt or I don't know what it is, but it makes it way better. And so for me, that's what I like. Um, some guys can go all pro bars. I mean, I've, I've been seeing these guys doing the all shake mix thing. Man, I'm out on that. I, I tried that a long time ago. That's like, I don't think that's sustainable to do everything that's, you know, pure liquid diet i mean i'm sure you know but again if that's what you want to do i, I always tell anybody go on a couple day hike go do a little you know scouting mountain hunt and put together a couple food bags and see what you really like there's some there's some mountain house or some you know whether it's heather's choice or some of these other ones that don't sit well with me at all and there's some that i really like so um again until you try it it's just conceptual knowledge and you, you know again like other guys' food bag, if that's what they like, that's great. This is what works for me. Um, and I, you know, I, I've used it a lot. And, yeah, so, again, yeah. it's more The other more. thing you had is three various candy bars, uh, Score, Butterfinger, Snickers, 620 calories, Pro Bar, 380, four ounces of mix. You talked about macadamia and almond, corn nuts, and jerky at 620 and then yep. three packs, drink flavoring, Crystal Light, et cetera, Wilderness Athlete. Uh, is there any other, like, um, uh, like the light? That, yeah, just any kind of electrolyte replacement. I'll, I'll take the 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 green Gatorade taste and um, Wilderness Athlete one, two. And, and, and really, I just, I'll just i knock a few of those back. If it's got a little bit of taste, I tend to drink more, and I put it in my bottle. Um you know, it's not mandatory, and it's and they don't weigh hardly anything. <clears throat> and again, like in the uh, in the in the macadamia almond corn nuts and jerky, I'll I'll either put you know a couple ounces of jerky in there, or I'll use those little like little long smoky things that you can buy at the gas station that are you know got the half life of plutonium that never go bad. <laughs> like there's just something about that type of food that you know. Like, will you actually cut those up and put them in their little Ziploc yep. bag for each day? Yep. Yep, okay. everything's got its own little Ziploc. Everything you see right there is broke down in, in its own Ziploc baggie. Um, just just so, you know, I take it out. It goes in the top of my pack every day. I know that's my food bag, and when it's gone, it's gone. Um, you know, I usually put my uh, my mountain house, you know, packed around stuff inside my my, my pack, but um, my food bag daily goes on top of my pack, and I just kind of know how much I can eat. Here's the lunchtime, and, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll save and ration some if I don't need it some big days where you'll have to dip into a little bit more. And you talk about three various candy bars, Score, Butterfinger, Snickers. Are you talking about three per day? And are you talking about full yep. size, like big, yep. like regular? Yep. Okay. Yep. And and sometimes I won't take candy bars. Sometimes I'll take, you know, protein bar. Or it just depends. I mean, I've done it so much now that a lot of it's when you're shopping, like what looks good. Like, I think that'll be pretty good. And, you know, that's, you know. Just depends on on what your personal tastes are. But a score bar, I can tell you, is pretty spectacular on a sheep hunt. <laughs> Something about okay. it. So, well, that covers that covers pretty much all the gear. Um, I appreciate you going over this list, and I've been using it for my own list. Uh, I just got all my mountain houses in. 
you know, one thing, do you ever eat those uh, chews, like the um, Honey Stinger Energy Chews? Do you ever, have you ever tried those? Or Yeah, I've taken those before, too. You know, like, as long as you replace calorie for calorie, you know, if you prefer those over a candy bar, and they're great. Um, you know, those Honey Stinger, the one that used to have Lance Armstrong on the back, right? Those those ones? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah those are good. Those Stroop Waffles, I think they call them. Those are, yeah. I'll, I'll pound those. Um, yeah, they're you know, again, as long as you get the same amount of calorie and eat, and you just try not to eat anything that you, that doesn't function well with you. Um, I always tell guys, man, try the mountain house before you take it up there. There are some yeah. I, that just do not sit well with you. And make sure you've, you've tasted them because, man, if you if you hate it at home, you're really going to hate it up there. Yeah, uh, that <laughs> for sure. Uh, what about you? Didn't mention like um, wet wipes or anything like that. Oh. Is that something? Is that a given? A hundred percent. Yeah, I can't believe it. In fact, I'm I'm writing them back down on my list right here. Yeah, those are <laughs> nice. Mountain money. Yeah. Okay. So and yeah, and there's there's going to be some little tiny stuff that you you know again again everybody's looking for the magic bullet, the greatest gear list on earth. The best gear list for me. This is this is the one that works for me. Um, you're gonna have to, you know, you, you'll you'll find out you'll have more of an impression of what you like, you know, after a couple hunts. And you know, again, that's what's fun about it. It's always gonna be changing all the time. Okay, well, I got one more question for you, and then I'm gonna let you go because I know you're a busy guy. Uh, when when we get a ram down, and so now we've got our camp, we've got you know meat, we've got a cape, we've got horns. Um, talk about how you actually pack the horns, the cape, and the meat between you and your guide. You know, it's going to be a two-man deal in NWT. Um, how do you put? You know, how do you structure the horns on the on the pack? Obviously, it depends on whether you're using an Icon Pro or an Ultra. But talk a little bit about you know placement. Do you move anything around? Like, how, what's your general rule of thumb? So it, it depends on, you know, how many guys you've got with you. If you've got three, it's different than two, but let's just say it was two. Um, you're generally going to have, depending on how much you shoot up the ram, if you're, you know, let, let's just say, let's just call it 80 pounds of meat at the most. I mean, that would be a lot. I mean, you're, you're talking, yeah, you know, let's just say 80 pounds of meat. Your cape, if you go life-size, I, I sit down, I pull the feet, I turn the lips and ears right there. I mean, I, I, I try not to leave any. I don't leave a single bone. I pop everything out of the hooves. Um, I, I, I do a, I, I like to get them down to next to nothing, especially if you're packing it. I get it really cooled down. Um, so I, you know, you try and split up the meat accordingly, like maybe the guy, and it depends on how much room you've got in your pack, but um, I always carry my own head. Um, it's just something I just do. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the guide will generally take a little bit more meat, and if you're going to take your head and your cape and then take, I think on the last trip, I took back straps, tender lines, one front shoulder, cape, and head, and I think he had the two hinds boned out and the front shoulder or something something along that line. You'll know, like, do your do your guide a favor, too, and go over and grab his pack. If it's way lighter than yours, you may want to offer to pick, take a little more meat. <laughs> um, yeah. So... And then, yeah, you just want to you break mean, it up. You mean if it's way heavier, if it's way if heavier it's, than you are. Yeah, if he's yeah. way heavier than you are, be a good dude. <laughs> go take, go yeah. get some weight from him. Um, having guided, as you know, sometimes uh, a lot of guys aren't, aren't really willing to grab a little extra weight. But, I mean, you don't want to make it as even as possible. Um, right. It, again, it, they'll probably insist on taking more. That's their guides. That's what they do. It's awesome. But um, you want to take as much as you're comfortable taking. Um, and, and you definitely should not be like, I don't think I got it to take any, <laughs> uh, don't, don't do that. Um, it depends on how far you're going too. I mean, if it's a quick trip to the strip, um, great. You may, you may take a couple loads with all your gear cause it's bulky. If you got a long ways to go, you're going to divide it up and take it in one shot. Um, so again, just depends. I put the, I put the head on top, our pack comes with some extra straps. There's uh, some little D-ring loops all over. I, I basically set the head right on top of the pack. You can either do it under the lid or over the lid um, and then run these extra straps, and I do it in an X. I, I cross it 
in between the yeah. sheep horns and go down the opposite side. And then the two side straps that come around that basically like contain where your um, the upper top straps that go around the horn that way so it fits real nice and doesn't rock back and forth. Um, again, you're going to, you know, it's one of those things like it's a nice load to carry. Take it slow. You're, you're uh, you know, it's going to be heavy. But usually, you know, again, if you're down towards the end of the trip or if you know you're getting out quick, you can, you can hammer a bunch of your food right there. Um, or dump some, or um, or you're you know down towards the end of your hunt, and you know your 20 pound food bag is down to two pounds. That you know it's not going to feel as heavy as as, you, as it would normally, and especially with two guys solo on a sheep is really a lot. Especially like you know I've had a couple times with a big horner by herself where it's a lot, but two guys in a doll sheep, even with a life size cape and a head, it's, it's not that bad. It's pretty manageable. So. Obviously, it depends on where you get a ram down, how close you are to the airstrip or what have you. Is it custom that the airstrip that you come in on, that you go back to that airstrip, or is it custom that there's lots of different places that they can land and you may be, you know, 10 miles up or down the drainage, they might be able to, you know, cut that distance in half. That That's kind of one question. What's custom? What have you seen? I think, and then I think the next, like an article... I think at our Arctic Red, Tavis is going to get as close as he humanly can. You know, if, if there's a place where they can get a, you can get a strip closer, that's what they're going to do. Obviously, under two guys, China, you're walking in, walking out. There's no air support. Period. I mean, if it's if you're 18 right. hours in, you're 18 hours out. Um, and, 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 and that was the next question I was going to ask you is, obviously, the guide. I'll have a sat phone too, but the guide will have communication. And let's say we get a ram down, and the guy says, okay, if we go you know, straight down off this thing, look down there in the bottom, he can land right there. Or if he says, oh, no, we've got, you know, six miles to, you know, anywhere to. My question is, is there a time when you say, let's just, let's just bomb it out of here and get to the strip? Or do you say, hey, let's just, you know, double it up or, or not double it up. Let's take our, you know, let's go halfway, let's camp tonight, and then let's go on in in the morning. I mean, like, what's general? Like, just let's just blow and go? Yeah, it kind of feels like how you're feeling. You know, it depends. If you've got a long, long ways to go, it might be a couple days to get out. If you've, you know, if it's an extra mile or two to get out in one night, you may just push it to the end again. That's that's where your guide will come in. He'll know. Um, and it'll depend on how you're feeling, um, how much time you've got left. Too, I you, assume, yeah, I are assume you raising they, weather? They look at weather and say, like, yeah. hey, if you, if you can get out, you know, in the next 12 hours, we can get you. If you can't, it's going to be, you know, four days, then that yep. might determine what you're going to do. Yeah, just, you know, it's one of those things. You just got to prepare for everything. You know, it, it it could be fairly easy. You may walk out of the NWT and go, wow, that was an awesome hunt, killed a nice ram, and it was quite a bit easier than I thought it was. Or you could walk away and go, that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Um, and same with the Chugach. You know, you could roll right in and kill a big ram, or you could have horrible weather and, hike to the end of the earth and you know you just be mentally prepared for it all and you won't be disappointed <laughs> yeah yeah so, i mean i'm i just want to have a great adventure and whatever happens it's great yeah uh, you're, you're gonna you're gonna have a great time what what one last ahead. thing uh talking about your feet have you ever had situations where your feet blister up or you know do you luco tape ahead of time or do you just luco tape or you know um, band-aids, what have you, you know, duct tape. Do you do that if needed, or do you go ahead? I know Justin Schaefer, he was like, no, I luco tape ahead of time, every time. You know, I do my big toe, my little toe. Um, you know, he does the back of his heels before he even starts. What's your What's your protocol? I'm not. I don't get a lot of blisters. Knock on wood. I'm. I'm saying that now, and I'm probably going to end up with horrible ones. Um, I wear two socks, which which you know causes some slip, and I've never had problems. So um, I do take uh, the Luco tape and or you know a moleskin back in the day or whatever. And I haven't had to use it. It's kind of dual purpose. Whether it's you know um, I haven't had to do that. If you have sensitive feet. I'd definitely bring enough to where, you know, and or if you were worried about it, um, I'd do it. I mean, again, I've done enough now where it's not something that I worry about. I, you know, the, the, the Rebel K, the boot, I, in fact, on the Alaska hunt, I actually um, took a brand new pair that I had never worn on that hunt um, just because it worked out. I was in the desert, and I um, had poked a hole in my 
in my boot and a bunch of cactus, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be waterproof, so I was, you know, breaking into new sets. I just took a brand new set. I wore them one day beforehand. Never had a problem. Um, again, that, that's not everybody's feet, so just, uh, yeah, I mean, I bet Those prepared. boots are unbelievable that way, though. I mean, I felt like after a day of wearing them, you know, this, this half size bigger, I felt like, I, I mean, I can't believe how quickly it broke in. Yeah, it's one of those things where if it fits your foot, it's a, it's an amazing boot. Um, and again, I haven't had a lot of foot problems, so. Um, but do you want to be? I, I, I've seen guys have horrible blisters and stuff, and it does not look pleasant. So um, I definitely plan accordingly. If you're if you're a guy that blisters up, I, I I'd make sure you know uh, get a game plan ahead of time. Um, yeah. Well, buddy, I appreciate all your time. Yeah. Um, one last thing, Jay. I was, uh, so. Yeah. Just before you go, um, one thing I always tell guys is, you know, when you go pack everything up and you're all ready to go, um, the best packing jobs are generally ruined in the last hour. And what I mean by that is, like, don't impulsively throw something in your pack because you might need it. I mean, I've, I've seen some, I've done it myself, where you get everything ready to go, everything's set, your bag's all packed, and all of a sudden, the last second, you go through 10 extra things in because it's like, I might need that, or like, if you haven't thought about it, if it's not on your physical gear list that you've checked off, don't add it in. I mean, like, it just just try as hard as you can not to add anything extra. That you know, because that's how you end up with a a tree saw and a Leatherman on a sheep hunt. <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, you're like, boy, I just threw it in at the last second, and you, you're not going to use it. But you know, it, it just just try to try to not add anything extra in. Uh, that's a great advice. That's awesome. Um, well, sounds good. I appreciate all the insight and, um, yeah, it's a lot of great, you know, firsthand knowledge there and I appreciate that. And, uh, we're going to go give her heck and I'll definitely report in when, when I get back and I just appreciate your time and I look forward to hearing about your adventure, um, on, on your next sheep hunt and can't wait to see that, uh, bear film, uh, that's coming out of, of those two giant bears you guys shot thanks jay yeah always a pleasure and yeah if anybody uh needs any help on gear or questions email anytime or give me a ring call in the main office that's that's what we do so we're always happy to help and um yeah it's gonna, it's gonna be, good. A, I'll, I'll be put, a great fall for you yeah it's gonna be great uh i'll put uh links i'll i'll put links uh to kuyu obviously in in the show notes uh and uh thanks for all your help okay all right catch you later all right, buddy. Thanks.